Okay, so it's time to continue our discussion, and this time we're going to be talking about the kinematics equations, which we started to introduce last time, and as I said, I'm trying to make these somewhat modular, so if you are just watching this video in isolation to learn the kinematics equations, it'll work with knowledge from anywhere else, uh, but also it is part of the larger series. So, as always, there's three quantities in physics. I'm going to say this over and over again because it's important. There's length, which you measure with length references. There's time, which you can measure with some sort of timing standard. And this, of course, is a timing standard that also counts up the time references for you because it's actually based on something like this where we count how many times something that takes the same amount of time to happen every time. <laughs> and then finally, we're talking about mass. Right, uh, which we measure by checking if things against a mass standard on a little balance like this. Oh, is it actually balanced though? It is just barely. This is not a very good, I 3D printed this balance and it just barely works. And of course, you know, there's various levels of sophistication for all of these, but it's the same idea for every instance, right? Or for every type of quantity, which is you count up how many instances fit into or are equal to the distance or mass or time that you want to measure, right? If you want to know how long something takes, you measure how many times the sun goes up and down, which is a pretty coarse resolution, but for a long time that was about as good as it could get. And if you want to measure how far something is, you fit, fit find how many distance re length references fit. Um, but of course, you can get more more get more clever right you don't have to set a ruler into every single little spot you can sort of you know use different triangulation techniques to measure distances from angles and of course you don't have to just take a you know unwieldy balance scale like this and put exactly the same mass on both sides and find a weight that exactly matches uh, you can use something like this uh, right which this is actually a uh, this is actually technically a little reloading scale. Uh, I've never actually uh, owned a firearm to use it with, but it, these are just a relatively inexpensive way to get a fairly precise uh, scale. Um, but you need to understand a little bit of physics to, to know how, how to use this in the first place, right? Uh, oh, is it? That's, that's overbalanced right now. See? It's a little bit difficult to even get it so you have to move I mean it's not that complicated you move the weights back and forth but it does take a minute right there we go but that requires understanding some things not a whole lot and people have been using balance scales like like this one for quite a while but they mostly use ones like this because they're a lot simpler to construct and operate and you generally didn't need to know mass that precisely. Plus this, you know, actually works if you do, if you have really exact mass references, this, you know, can end up working better. And why do I, why do I keep mentioning this every single time? Well, because it's important and also because it bothers me when people say that there's all these other, you know, fun, fundamental quantities that you need. And it's like, no, there's, there's only three. There's mass, length, and time. And if anybody says that you need things like temperature or luminosity as fundamental units, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're lying. <laughs> you know, because as we're starting to talk about, all other units are constructed by multiplying and dividing these other units multiple times, right? So we've been talking about velocity, which is constructed by taking a distance uh, and dividing it by a time, and then acceleration, which is taking a velocity and dividing that by a time, which is equivalent to taking a distance and dividing it by a time squared. And now we're going to start talking about the kinematics equations and talking about Newton's second law, F equals ma, right? Because in order to make use of this, we need to understand acceleration, which we introduced last time as the change in velocity or speed per unit time. And we need to understand mass and force. And so force is 
sort of, you know, just a thing that exists, right? People have a notion of it, of what it is, you know, that, you know, pushing and pulling, and it's this sort of, like, viscerally intuitive thing. Uh, and mass, to some extent, is as well, right? We have a notion that... Uh, objects, you know, one, they have a, have a weight to them, right? Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit today, right? That, you know, if an object has some mass, then it also has some weight. And, well, on the Earth's surface, those things are completely equivalent. Well, they're always related to each other. And so F equals MA now lets us construct the equations for or lets us construct the units, I'm sorry, it is the equation, and it lets us construct the units for F, right? Because, well, it follows, right, if acceleration is change in velocity per time, and velocity is change in distance per time, so this is change in distance per time squared, and this is its own, it's like like uh, David Pumpkins, it's its own thing, <laughs> mass, then, well, force is the construct of you know, distance per time squared times mass, right? So force does not get its own intrinsic set of units because it's just constructed out of other things, out of mass, length, and time. So there, we've finally started to put them all together. Um, but then you might be saying, okay, Newton's second law is great. You, you, you've, you've stated it. Um, where does it come from? And well, we're basically going to start justifying it today using these simple experiments we can do just dropping an object near the Earth's surface. And we're doing that even though it's kind of noisy and complicated. And why not do it the way that Newton originally did it, by looking at Kepler's laws and the orbits of stars and planets? Well, a few reasons. One, the math is fairly complicated, like I was saying last time. And it's not so crazy complicated that you can't do it with, you know... It's... It's the sort of thing you learn to do in an upper division but undergraduate physics course, and so I'd like to uh, take this series on to the point where I'll do a... This is, you know, classical mechanics level one, and I, in addition to doing all of the other lower division subjects, I'd like to do classical mechanics two at some point where we will explain uh, how to do that math. Uh, but more importantly, the experiments you need to actually ver verify Kepler's laws, uh, they're difficult even in principle, and in modern times, we have to do them through a bunch of light pollution, and also, they take literally years to do, if you want to actually do them yourself, uh, versus these experiments you can do in, like, less than one second. <laughs> so, it's quite a bit more practical to uh, sort of, you know, actually validate it, and that's my goal, is, right, is I want to be able to, you know, not just say, like, oh, you know, this was validated by so-and-so however many hundred years ago, therefore it must be true. It's like, no, you can go out of the real world, and you can check this is actually true, because it's a long-standing frustration of mine that there's a lot of things that are, you know, set up, you know, supposedly for, to make them easier to understand for a student or whatever, and, uh, but other times they're just these sort of myths that get propagated, and you go out into the real world, and you're like, well, I don't even close to true, <laughs> you know, um, and not that I've lived, you know, in the real, real world, I've spent my life in the ivory tower of academia, but, uh, even within that context, uh, there's tons of things that, you know, people will tell you that'll turn out to not be true, so I want to always tell you things you can go and verify yourself, um, and so that's why there's this focus on experiments. Also, of course, because I'm an experimentalist, not a theorist. But I, I like theory, and as I was mentioning, I like to try to bring them together. So, but let's start deriving and analyzing things from, you know, perspective of uh, analyzing this simple, for simple forms of motion, right? So I was talking last week about, you know, if we want to think about these simplest, you know, basically the simplest motion we can po possibly describe, right? The simplest, you know, trajectory, I would say, or, you know, s simplest path through space uh, as a function of time, which is to just move in a straight line at a constant speed, I, or move, you know, at i.e. move at a constant velocity. Because uh, if you moved at a constant speed, but turned, you would not have a constant velocity, which would make our analysis more complicated. So, Straight line, constant speed, equals constant velocity. So position as a function of time looks like this, where it just goes, you know, bigger number, or if it were, you know, if we turned around and faced the other direction, it would be going down to a smaller 
all are to a more neg to a more negative number. Um, and so then the graph of velocity uh, is just a straight line at whatever the you know m magnitude of our velocity there is. Um, or you know we could have a sort of one dimensional vector quantity and say you know which we are which we are doing and we say you know positive is up negative is down um, but you know just pick some direction and you know positive is in that direction and negative is uh, you know in the op exact opposite direction and so for us that's going to generally be positive is up negative is down and we're not going to deal with vector quantities more complicated than that just yet so then what about something a little bit more complicated, right? Well, what's the next most complicated thing after a constant velocity? Um, well, that's what I've sh been showing the last couple of lectures of, you know, an object, you know, dropping and picking up speed at a uniform rate, where instead of velocity being constant, acceleration is constant, right? The rate of change of velocity is constant, and then velocity kind of gets bumped up, right? Where velocity was a horizontal line, uh, now it's a straight line that's pointing up, and the horizontal line is acceleration, and then position turns into this curve, right? Where here, it's if we're accelerating in the positive, in a, in a, this is if we were accelerating in a positive direction, right? Again, all, again, if you just, you can just flip this around and make it, you know, uh, curve the other way if you wanted to find the other direction as positive, or if you're just going, accelerating the opposite way. But it generally makes more sense to define up as positive, and gravity, of course, pulls things down. So I wanted to just show again real quick and uh, re-upload this as part of the notes, because I put the PDF of the notes uh, on a not, uh, my personal website isn't very good. Um, it's really just a sort of quick and easy way to host the files of the PDFs and PowerPoints that I want to be able to upload. I'll probably move it to actually an even more minimal site uh, at some point, but these 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 uh, sort of slides along with the PowerPoints are, are always available, as is the, the code that I use when I do um, software-based uh, analysis. Um, so, but I was we were talking about last time how, you know, if you want to take the derivative of, you know, this function with respect to time, it's really easy. You have to, you know, you take the, you know, definition of the derivative again, limit as, you know, delta t goes to zero of delta y over delta t. In this case, it's, you know, you can check this algebra, but it's totally trivial, right, uh, that you just end up back with, you know, v. Um, you know, when we evaluate the instantaneous velocity, we just get back, you know, this number, which is why we wrote it down and called, instead of just calling this some random thing, we called it v, because we know it's going to end up, you know, coming back to us as, you know, derivative with respect to time, uh, which is the definition of velocity. Or derivative, definition of velocity is derivative position with respect to time. You can take derivative of all sorts of quantities with respect to time. Um, okay, and so then, you know, what about this more complicated one, you know, one half at squared? Uh, well, then again, we apply our definition of the derivative, delta y over delta t, limit as delta t goes to zero, and it's a little more complicated now, and, you know, we do out this algebra t plus delta t squared minus minus one half, you know, one half a times t plus delta t squared. And then, you know, you know, one half a, you know, t squared minus one half a t squared cancels out uh, this term and this term. And then you're in, you're left with just one half a times t times two t. Um, so that just leaves you with a, and that, that is multiplied by delta t divided by delta t. And then the only thing you're left with that doesn't sort of cancel out nicely is this one half a delta t squared and when divided by delta t becomes uh, one half times a times delta t to the first power uh, and that's where the fact that we are taking delta t going to zero finally comes into play and, and this term goes to zero because of the limit whereas the rest just go to zero just because they're zero even if delta t even, even over some finite interval of time those other quantities are all zero. Uh, but you, you notice th this is what this is the one where if, if you if you put this in the midpoint then it works even if you don't take e even this works even if you don't take delta t zero but at the end of all that we just get you know a times t and so that's sort of where that kinematic equation of one half a times t squared comes from so saying you know last time how we're defining this thing called an integral too which is the opposite of a derivative right we have you know these sort of reverse processes of differentiation and, and integration one where we see 
how you know what is the slope of you know some function and the other where we say what is the sort of area under some function or you know what is the difference between two points in a function versus what is the sum of multiple points in a function and that ends up being the basis by which we derive the kinematics equations so i thought i'd you know show the algebra real quick for going in the opposite direction of what do you do if you want to integrate a constant velocity well you just say y is equal to whatever you know why not whatever position you start at plus the sum of you know velocity over some time interval times the amount of time elapsed um, and you just sum over all the time intervals and they're all the same because you're just traveling at a constant velocity and so you just end up getting right back to you know you know you get you know v times t times you know n over n and you know this just cancels and gives gives you right back to v times t so but what about um, how do we get uh, this one half at squared well say you know say we start with the equation that we got last time right what if we what if we uh, you know start with uh, you know v is equal to a times t and if, instead of deriving that from one half at squared what if we uh, start with you know v is equal to a times t because that's you know kind of our uh, you know thing that we are starting with we're saying that you know what if something just keeps picking up speed at a constant rate well that's a little bit harder to to do than this totally trivial case but um you know we just have to do a little bit of algebra and use a, a sum formula which actually is the sum of uh a bunch of integers um so you know we say, you know, again, sum over v of t times delta t. Uh, and then we're going to take the limit as delta t goes to zero, which we do by saying, you know, uh, let n go to infinity as we take the sum over, you know, a times t, because we're saying that, you know, v of t is equal to a times t. Uh, whatever our final time is going to be divided by a uh, big N number of data points. And so, okay, well then that's actually equivalent to if we're dividing it into uh, you know n different segments which let me find the uh, in here in this giant mess you know if we're dividing it into you know uh, this is you know say n different little segments here that's the equivalent of you know that's the equivalent <laughs> other side left and right or reversed when I'm looking backwards the, the you know that's the equivalent of the final time divided by big n times little n where little n is the you know number this is the sum of any of this is the sum from n equals 1 to n equals big n remember uh, that's what this how this sum notation works so you know a over t you know t final over you know big n um, times one times two times three you know times one plus times two plus times three um, and so on and so forth um, when I say it out loud that might sound clear as mud but uh, you know hopefully the math is clear and maybe I'll write some more detailed notes this is all a slow process of me writing notes but uh, if enough people are watching this to this point uh, to have questions always feel free to leave one in the comments and uh, I have plenty of free time on my hands if you'd uh, like some help out with any of these subjects uh, not uh, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, for hire or anything I'm just uh, well I mean I mean if a community college wants to hire me as a professor great but uh, otherwise I'm just uh, you know feel free to ask questions I don't really have a whole lot I'm doing with myself. <laughs> I'll I'll answer them. Um, so, but the uh, you know sum over n um, that that it just ends up being the sum over little n. Uh, and there's a formula for that, which is just you know big n times big n plus one. And then the only way we end up needing to use the limit again, it's only one little thing where the limit actually comes in. Where you know in the limit of n go big n goes to infinity, um, big n and big n plus one are approximately the same. So then it just becomes big n squared divided by big n squared, uh, and those cancel, and you just end up with this two that also comes from the formula for the sum over n, uh, and then that's how you end up with one half at squared. So uh, that might sound kind of clear as mud, uh, but remember, that's why we can take it back to geometry, right? Where we just say the height of the, this is a triangle, right? The base is just equal to T and the height is equal to 
a times t because that's what this line is. It's the the you know line v of t is equal to a times t, and the area of a triangle is one half base times height, and you know it's the area because it's the sum of all the products of v times t, which is like a rectangle. Um, you know, it works. <laughs> this is you know maybe the problem in trying to sort of breeze into great calculus along with physics, but uh, this is the subject it was invented to deal with. So. Let's keep going. <laughs> All right. So now we finally developed these equations, which I'm telling you were derived uh, from deriving and integrating uh, this, or from really they're derived from integrating this assumption here, which we're saying that uh, a is equal to a constant, right? If something is just picking up speed at a uniform rate, then you can sort of bump up this ladder by integrating to get then therefore its velocity if it's accelerating at a constant rate then its velocity at any given time is just whatever velocity it starts with plus the rate at which it's at rate at which it's accelerating a times the time elapsed and then if you integrate that equation to say okay well you know how far it has gone is how fast it's traveling times the time and the time the how fast it's traveling is changing as a function of time, but that's why we invented this process of the integral to deal with that, and that equation ends up being 1 half at squared plus v0 t plus y0. And then we can go back down this ladder by saying, you know, okay, well, from that equation, if I take the derivative to figure out how fast I'm going, I get, you know, a times t plus v0, because, you know, derivative of, derivative of a constant is zero, derivative of uh, a uh, straight, of a straight line is just the coefficient of that straight line. And, you know, derivative of a horse, constant meaning like a horizontal line, and derivative of a, of a straight line, a, you know, linear function uh, is just, you know, the, you know, y, y equals mx plus b, it's just the, it, it's just v, right? Derivative of v times t with respect to t, you know, this is the constant velocity term, so it's just going to give us v naught. And then, you know, derivative of this is the thing we had to do a little bit of trickery to get, but it's just, you know, a times t, that bumps us back down. And again, derivative of this, just take the derivative of a times t with respect to t, that just gives you a, and then you're back down here. Okay, so we've derived all that, and we've seen experimentally that we have data that shows something like that. Um, why, why, why is that happening, right? Why would something accelerate at a constant rate? And so now we're going to, you know, start exploring like what is the situation with that happen, where that happens? And well, there's lots of situations where that happens, but the most immediately obvious and useful one is if something is just falling, right? And it's because, you know, as long as you stake, this is an approximation, but it's a really, really useful one. As long as you're close to the Earth's surface, how hard it's pulling on an object is just proportional to its mass, right? Because mass and weight are not the same thing, right? The further away you get from the Earth, the smaller the weight of this object, but its mass will always be the same. But the reason that's really useful, right, is we have the equation of F equals MA, but we also have another equation that the force due to gravity is just equal to the mass times some constant that we call lowercase g here, little g, um, that is, that's the thing that I'm just telling you is 9.8 meters per second. And well, if f equals, if f equals ma, yeah, f equals ma and, uh, you know, f equals mg, well, it's pretty obvious that those two cancel and we just have a is equal to a constant is equal to g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, and this is the other thing that Galileo famously sort of uh, did experiments to verify and may or may not have actually dropped objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but he definitely did do experiments to verify this principle and put it out there that it was true, that objects near the Earth's surface fall at a constant rate. And so... Well, let's. We've already seen one example of that, but uh, let me show you uh, another one real quick. Okay, so this is another example of me ready to drop something. In this case, it's a tennis ball rather than a little magnet, and that will make it a little bit easier to see. And of course, I again have a length scale uh, on the side there, 
Uh, unfortunately, it's a length scale in uh, feet, but that's fine. I'm going to superimpose some lines on there to show you uh, position in meter in, well, in, I guess in decimeters. Yeah, I'll, I'll make markings every 10 centimeters so that it's easier to do things in metric. And so we're just going to drop the object and watch it fall, and it's going to accelerate at a constant rate, just like the little magnet toy in previous examples. And here we go. This time I managed to catch it. Okay, so let's analyze that. All right, so what we're looking at now is the individual frames from that slow motion video I just showed you. And there's, as promised, some magenta lines every 10 centimeters so that the tennis ball will be easy to track. And there is also a timing indicator based on the frame number. So we're kind of cheating here because we're using artificial timing standards uh, because like I keep saying, well, we have access to a bunch of technology today, but we don't have access to a bunch of things they did in the past, like skies free of light pollution and plenty of time on our hands. And by plenty of time, I mean years and years with the patronage of like, you know, various institutions. So let's go ahead and see what happens as this drops. So this is time equals zero right before I drop it. And we're, what we're showing as these numbers on the left, these are theoretical calculations, right? So this is just assuming the uh, given value of 9.8 for A. How fast or how far would the tennis ball have traveled and how fast would it be going? And let's see how it matches up with what we see. So this is after just 50 milliseconds. So theoretically, it would have traveled about one centimeter, uh, which looks about right. It's just barely crossing the first line there. Because uh, I guess we're going to define distances from the bottom of the tennis ball because I started I started it with the tennis ball right above the uh, ceiling beam where the measuring tape is hanging from. So 50 milliseconds gone ten gone uh, one centimeter. After 100 milliseconds, it's supposed to have gone 5 centimeters, and that's about right because it's about halfway between those two markings, which are 10 centimeters. And its speed is supposedly just under 1 meter per second, uh, which remember, that's 1 meter per second. Uh, so in a, you know, these, th we're watching 50 milliseconds between frames here. Uh, so, you know, it would be actually go 1 20th of a meter, uh, which is about how far it's gone, you know. Uh, five centimeters. So next one, it should have traveled about uh, 11 centimeters. And that also looks about right. It's just past the first line. And 0.19 meters, 190 centimeters, just about to hit the second line. So that's not too far off. And velocity is now about two meters per second. And so let's just keep going. 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, 0 0.45, 0 0.5, 0 0.55, 0.6, and 0 0.65, and 0 0.7, it finally hits the ground. And at that point, it's traveling at 6.86 meters per second, and it has traveled 2.4 meters, which, uh, you know, spoiler, guess how many of these markings there are? Did you guess 24? Well, that's how many there are. <laughs> so it's a pretty good model. And I keep saying that we don't want to make, you know, we don't want to have some model of reality in our head that is an idealization and not think about the real world. But that's only kind of the uh, intro, intro, in, intro to the intro <laughs> statement. Really, what I would say is we never want to make an assumption and then forget that we made it, right? Because... There's nothing wrong with making assumptions. Making assumptions is how we can analyze anything. The thing that's a problem is when you make an assumption and you assume that assumption will be valid for 
every possible situation, when in reality, it doesn't probably doesn't apply to any situation perfectly. So our assumption of a constant acceleration is a pretty decent one, because you can see as the frame, as each frame advances, it's picking up more and more speed, and the rate at which it does that is pretty constant. But as we saw from previous graphs, our sort of model doesn't necessarily line up with reality, and the rate of acceleration doesn't necessarily perfectly line up with what we actually see. But the remarkable thing about physics is that we can get very close. We're never perfect. And in my opinion, as such, we should never think of our theoretical models as having some true ontological reality. But the fact that it's possible to use our brains to understand mathematical models that predict reality at all is pretty remarkable to me and pretty cool. And, you know, to be honest, pretty darn useful. <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look at another scenario, which is, well, what if I throw a tennis ball up in the air? Well, now I'm going to show you just the one half at squared term because we don't know what the velocity is, right? Because it starts with some velocity, right? I throw it up in the air and we don't know exactly what that velocity is. We just know that it's starting at time equals zero at some point. And we could either define that as zero or we could define the ground as zero or we could define the top as zero. But for right now, let's just define right as it leaves my hand as zero, and let's see what would gravity do to it, because gravity would actually make it drop, but it's going to go up, right? So what happens is, well, at first it's traveling out of my hand, and it's going at a good solid clip. It travels up, like, what, 20 centimeters, just in the first 50 milliseconds. And from that, you could already sort of estimate the starting velocity. But remember, dealing with a finite frame rate here, as you always will, uh, I'm actually showing you every 12th frame. So it's actually 240 frames per second. And this is uh, only what? Uh, oh, I should be able to, Oh, this is only 20 frames per second, right? Because it's uh, every 50 milliseconds. Um, so, but that so you could already get an s you could already actually get an estimate from that of twenty centimeters in fifty milliseconds is about four meters per second. But let's see if we can do a little bit better, and we'll see it goes up twenty centimeters the first one, and the next one goes up mm, not twenty anymore, you know, not quite, and then a little bit less again, slows down, slows down, slows down, slows down. And there, at 0.4 seconds to 0.5 seconds, it's pretty much just standing still up by that beam. And it starts coming back down, starts coming back down, starts coming back down, down, down. And eventually, I catch it back in my hand after 9 tenths of a second. So, well, I guess since we went through that PowerPoint continuously, let me show you the movie for that real quick. So here's the full slow motion video of me tossing it up in the air, so no magenta markings on there yet. Uh, and so, you know, it actually starts with me tossing it up, and I conveniently started those frames for you right as it leaves my hand, and it's just me throwing a tennis ball and catching it. <laughs> it's not that remarkable, but analyzing motion is pretty cool. Oh, and as a brief aside, I realize that not everyone might be comfortable using uh, these various software tools for extracting video frames. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do it. You can use open computer vision like I do. You can use uh, just the FFmpeg tool. You can use several other things. But uh, if you're not comfortable doing those things, what you can do is you can just make a recording uh, and then set uh, another device with a timer running in the field of view and use that for your timing. And then of course you still need something to use for your distance reference. But and you want to make sure that it has nice, clearly visible markings on this. On that, uh, this tape measure gets a little bit hard to see. Uh, but with those two things combined, you could do this experiment yourself without the need for any sort of knowledge of programming or anything like that. Although, as always, I make the scripts uh, I use available uh, if you want to try them out on these 
video clips or try making your own recordings and using the code for that, which is a fantastic exercise. But if you don't want to do any of that, but you still want to try your own experiments, just put uh, you know another device with a timer running uh, in the background, uh, and then you can do it like this, right, where I just reset the timer uh, when I'm just about ready to drop the object, <laughs> and then run up real quick and uh, go ahead and drop it. Oh, there's the, the slow motion sound. Uh, also, pretty much, if you, you could do this at just a standard 24, fra 24 30 frames per second, but these days, de most devices, I think, will do uh, 240. So uh, that's how to do it. If, oh, I didn't catch it that time. <laughs> but the, that's how to do it if you don't want to learn all these little programming tricks. Uh, just put a little timer in the background there and then compare the timestamps uh, by just pausing the video. <laughs> Okay, so now that we've seen that data, let's do some other calculations and compare those to the data, because I already showed you calculate theoretical calculation on every slide, but let's go through one real quick. So let's go through uh, sort of calculation in reverse, because kinematics equations are so you can go kind of front ways and back ways through a bunch of different things and get, you know, given some pieces of information, figure out the information that you don't have and, you know, potentially make predictions. So, you know, what about using this equation, the top kinematics equation for position, to figure out how long it will take to fall all the way from the top at 2.4 meters, which is how high the ceiling beam is, about eight feet, down to, uh, you know, the bottom at zero meters. So we know that the starting speed is zero meters per second, and we know that acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, so when will y equal zero, i.e. when do we hit the ground? Well, we just, you know, set that equation. We say zero is equal to 2.4 minus one half times 9.8 times t squared. And well, very simple algebra, 2.4 is equal to 4.9 times t squared. t is equal to the square root of 2.4 divided by 4.9. And that's around 0 0.7 seconds. And, well, take a look at the slide. Lo and behold, that is pretty much when it hits the ground. <laughs> at least, uh, you know, to a you know sufficient degree of precision, which we're starting to care a little bit more about significant figures here, right? Um, you know, we have, uh, we basically have two, right? And so that goes to the 0.7, so that's, you know, two, two sig figs, um, because, you know, we, we, we actually do have better resolution than 2.4, uh, but we're going to stick to uh, increments of 10 centimeters to make it so that it could be fairly easy to do yourself. Uh, technically, we could go all the way down to the resolution of an individual pixel, which would be like less than one millimeter, uh, and we could also go down to the timing resolution of 1 240th of a second, uh, but I want to make this easier to replicate. So 0 0.7 seconds is fairly accurate. So yay, turns out these approximations are actually at least halfway decent. So what about calculating the velocity of the tennis ball after I threw it up in the air, right? Uh, you know, I won't throw this rock as fast, but you know, do something like that. Well, we calculate that by just taking a look at uh, when it gets to the top. <laughs> so, you know, we can do it two ways. And this first way is we use the first kinematics equation again, and we say uh, we know that it starts at 1.4 meters because we're going to define the ground as being zero meters for this. Uh, and to find positive is up, negative is down. So it's positive 1.4 meters off the ground when it starts. We don't know the initial velocity of v0, but we still always know that a is just minus 9.8 meters per second squared because it's being pulled down, right? It's accelerating down in a, the negative direction. So, you know, all right. We also have this equation, but that's not going to help us in this, this form. Um, so we know that when it reaches the top, it is, you know, y of zero, we know that it reaches the top at 0 0.45 seconds, just from watching the movie or looking at the frames I extracted. And so we know the top is 2.3 meters, just from how long the measuring tape is. So 2.3, 1.4, unknown, one half gt squared. We plug all that in down here and do some algebra, right? 
not very complicated algebra, but plug all those numbers in and you end up with V naught times 0 0.45, which comes from this middle term, is equal to 0 0.9 plus 1.0, which comes from, come, which come from the uh, difference in the distances, y minus y naught, and from the 1 half at squared respectively. Um, and then, well, you divide the, you know, take the sum of those, divide that by 0 0.45, and we get 4.2 meters per second, which again, not exactly what we got from just comparing the first two frames I showed you. Because, but it's, it's, you know, to one sig fig, it is the same, right? Uh, which is all you get from comparing those two frames. Um, you know, it's about four meters per second. Well, what if we did it? We could do it another way. Uh, we could, we could use this V equals V naught plus AT because we know that at 0 0.45 seconds, uh, when it's at the top of its trajectory, it's also not moving, right? Uh, it hits, it reaches the top because it stops moving. It kind of momentarily hovers there uh, and then starts accelerating downwards. Although it's always accelerating, it's just that there is a an instant, an instant in time when the instantaneous velocity is zero, and we can use that fact. We can say that v of 0 0.45 seconds, not times, but v as a function of. Uh, is equal to v naught minus 9.8 times t, which is equal to v naught minus 9.8 times 0 0.45. So v naught minus 4.4 is equal to zero. So v naught is equal to 4.4. And that is different from our other answer by 5%, right? You know, 4.4 and 4.2 are, are, yeah, are 5% off from each other. Eh, cameras, they're hard. Uh, there we go. Oh, there we actually go. Yeah, 4.4 and 4.2. So, again, why are those two answers slightly different? Well, again, because the frame rate is finite, because our model isn't perfect, and because our spatial resolution isn't infinite. And it turns out that if you analyze the trajectory, it's mostly not that our model is wrong, right? Uh, if you look at the sort of trajectory as a function of time for every frame, which I extracted with the fancy fancy software, I'll put it up right now, that looks pretty much just like a parabola, right? Um, and if you evaluated it that way, uh, you just get one answer, and you don't have to futz around with this. So, but there's always going to be some error, which again, that's what I would say as an experimentalist, but I think it's important to emphasize that, uh, you know, these models work and just because they don't work perfectly, uh, doesn't mean that we shouldn't use them, but you should always be aware of context in which a model will and won't work. So the kinematics equations work when for one reason or another, acceleration is constant. And that happens when for one reason or another force is constant and if you want to know why the force isn't actually constant and why there might be some errors and actual errors in the model, the answer, of course, is <laughs> air, right? I do that because I can <laughs> feel a force on my hand. And I'm sorry, actually, I probably blew into the microphone. You could hear that, but maybe that's for the best. You know, air causes, you know, moving through the air causes a force, right? And it causes a force that tends to slow you down. And that's why it's hard to tell that there's a uniform acceleration due to gravity uh, near the Earth's surface. But it's a it's a good approximation, especially for nice dense objects. So it's, I, I didn't drop this rock, one, because it's harder for the computer vision to track, and two, because I didn't want to put a crack in the floors. <laughs> Tennis ball, much better object to drop. Go with that. And it's even better to track with the computer vision if you want to learn that too. Uh, there is, you know, famously, when they went to the moon, they actually did drop a... A uh, hammer, which is a very dense object, and a very and a feather, which is a very light object, and they did both accelerate at the same rate. Although that rate was not 9.8 because meters per second squared, because they were on the moon, which has a different surface gravity than the Earth. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than 
on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, Which proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. But anyways, once again, probably all clear as mud, but what can I say? Um, yeah, if you have a constant force, you have a constant acceleration, because Newton's Law is true. And we're hopefully kind of showing that, because it's relatively easy to show that, you know, objects of the same mass uh, don't change their weight. They always weigh the same when they're near Earth's surface. And we've now seen that if you just let them fall, um, you know, they accelerate at pretty much a constant rate. So that is starting to provide some evidence for F equals MA. And then that in turn, we can in turn flip that on its head where we can use that as evidence for F equals MA. Or we can start saying because we have evidence for that model, we can use it provided that the assumptions that we're putting into it are valid. And, well, it turns out all of this is a little bit of a lie, right? This is all called classical mechanics because, of course, there's quantum mechanics that supplants classical mechanics. But something doesn't need to be, you know, flawlessly true in every situation to be useful and interesting, which, again, is what I would say as an experimentalist. But that's my two cents. Um, that's how to use the kinematics equations. Next week, we are going to expand more. And next week, we are going to worry more about vectors and start not maybe not next week, probably be end up being two weeks, because that has been my cadence so far, but I'm going to try to do it next week, uh, but at least within two weeks, we're going to talk about how to actually move in two dimensions and analyze when instead of just dropping like this, just dropping like this, or tossing up like this, what if I toss it like this, and it travels, you know, in some trajectory like that, where it's moving horizontally while it also moves vertically. Um, and it's going to be kinematics again, but with uh, X and Y instead of just Y always with T in there. So, anyways, I hope that was useful. Probably clear as mud. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye.